Okay. I have to say that um, I'm not quite sure what the owners of the building up to with their colour schemes, but um, uh, it's possibly better than last week anyway. Um, and the other thing is John um, just came up and sort of explained what happened. We have a, a system now that it's brilliant when it works and it works most of the time, but it's in a loop and you can't go back. And so that's why we had to wait for the, and, and he's started kicking himself and I punched him to stop him <laughs> from kicking himself. Right, we're gonna carry on in uh, Matthew chapter nine uh, and, and try and finish up the, the passage today. Uh, the last four verses belong to chapter 10, so we won't get there. Uh, and Matthew nine, is a real, um, it's like Matthew got gobs of paint, just threw it at the canvas because there's a whole lot of um, different things going on here, a lot of things going on in there. And it's, uh, the problem with Matthew is that Luke quite clearly states at the start of his um, gospel that he arranged it in orderly chronological order which is what a Gentile would do. The Jewish people couldn't care less about that. Uh, and Matthew's um, uh, gospel is all about proving to the Jewish people, because he wrote to the Jewish believers, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so his gospel is based on a thematic uh, foundation. And so he picks things all over the place. He could care less about chronological order. He just wants to reinforce a theme that he's bringing on at the moment. And what really has happened over the last couple of teachings when we're doing uh, from Matthew is that Jesus is now asserting his authority over everything in Israel, over uh, the law, which was in um, the Sermon on the Mount, over sickness, death, and uh, uh, even over um, the, the natural elements when he calmed the storm on the, on the sea. So he's displaying now his authority. And half of this verse that we're going to go today happens before, unfortunately, Matthew chapter 12, when they nationally reject him. And you need to know that because the reason why Jesus came to this earth was to save the lost. Okay, that was it. That's, he knew that he came here to... Uh, to die. That was his this whole um, um, prophecy for the uh, first advent. But in many ways, he had to wake up the ideas of Israel, which had been poisoned by Pharisaic Judaism for the previous 450 years, and we'll get into that halfway through this message. But Jesus now, in deliberately in this last uh, couple of messages, he lobbed two hand grenades into Jewish theology. It was amazing. In fact, you know, there could be small nuclear bombs because what he did when he healed the leper, it just amazed all of Israel. And it alerted the Sanhedrin that something serious was going on here. And so this is when they started, and last time when we were in Matthew a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the fact that there are three stages. There's the first stage of observation, the second stage of interrogation, and the third stage of making a decision. And in Matthew chapter 12, the Sanhedrin, by the way, the Sanhedrin was never the religious leadership of Israel. It was the political leadership of Israel because the Romans had set it up and they were paid to govern Israel. And so the Sanhedrin was only interested in its own survival and its own well-being. Now, we don't have governments like that these days, do we? We do not have them, I'm sure. There must be one some out there somewhere. 
And so what he's done now is that he's just thrown this leper uh, healing hand grenade into them, which last time we saw draw, drew scribes and Pharisees from every town and village in the Galilee and in Judea, Judea and from out of Jerusalem. And that was sort seen last time. And so now the second thing he's done, when he, he healed the paralytic in Peter's house last time, time we were together in this chapter, he did a more demonstrative thing that just really, um, it actually sent the, the, the Pharisees over the edge. And that was the beginning of the end for Jesus. From there on in, they were starting to plot to kill him because what did he do? In healing the paralytic, he said to him, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And as far as they're concerned, the Pharisees, Pharisees are concerned, only God can forgive sins, you think? And he was just saying, he did that deliberately to make them work out whether or not they're going to accept him as God, and they don't, and they won't. But in John chapter 12, which we won't go there, it does actually say that many of the Pharisees believed in him, but they did not speak it out for fear of the Jews. All right? They would be ostracized from Jewish society if you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And I think I, two weeks ago we looked at Nicodemus, who was one of the wealthiest, most respected men in all of Israel. And at the end of Jesus' ministry on this earth, when he and Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus, got Jesus taken down from the cross and then they carried him to the garden tomb, uh, that was a declaration of his faith in Jesus. And the Talmud, 500 years later on, records that he died in poverty, totally rejected by Jewish society. And that's what faith in Jesus cost you in those days. And so we're going to go from Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 34. And Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And so he arose and followed him. When I was a really young Christian, I was reading these passages, I, I was amazed at this process. And I, without knowing the background, and unless you know the background, it doesn't make sense. Because it li it's like Jesus just walks up to someone and says, follow me, and they leave everything and they follow him. But by this time, Jesus is famous throughout Israel. Everyone knows who he is or claiming to be who he is. And so it was no surprise to Matthew that Jesus came up to him. Do you remember when he was walking around the shores of Galilee uh, early in his ministry and he walked up to uh, Peter and Andrew and said, follow me? And they did. Why? Because right at the start of John the Baptist's ministry, when Jesus came down, and to be baptized by John, uh, John, uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God uh, who taketh away the sin of the world. That's a messianic title. You understand? And the other thing that happened was that uh, when the dove alighted down upon him, the dove was a symbol of the Holy Spirit on his shoulder, there were two, two fishermen there from the Galilee. One of them was Andrew, and one of them was John because they were friends, and they were in the same business. And it says that later in John's um, uh, gospel. So Andrew and John saw them, and they actually followed Jesus around for the rest of that day. Then they had to go back to the Galilee. Uh, so they obviously told their brothers all that had happened in uh, the, the uh, baptismal event with John and Jesus. So when Jesus was walking around the shores of Galilee, and he looked at the two sets of brothers who were fishermen and said, follow me, they knew exactly who he was. And so in faith, they left everything and, and followed him. So it's not just out of the blue. There is a background to this, and there's a reason for this. And so he, he followed Jesus, and now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, Matthew's house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him, and his disciples. Now, this is the second stage. We're going through this because we uh, really pushed it through at the end of last message, and I just want to, because this leads into the next thing. And so 
the sinners and the tax collectors came into Matthew's house. Why would it be Matthew's house? Because they wouldn't be allowed in any other house. Tax collectors and sinners are excluded from Jewish society. They couldn't be in anyone else's house. And so what happens now is, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, this is the second stage. They're now asking questions. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because as far as Pharisaic Judaism was concerned, they were rejected totally from uh, Israeli society. You didn't um, cohabit, you didn't talk, you didn't uh, have anything to do with tax collectors and sinners. But here's what, uh, what Jesus said in verse 12. When Jesus heard that, the question, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a, of a physician, but those who are sick. And he's really prodding them now because the Pharisees considered themselves theologically and spiritually well. Do you understand? And they considered tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners and pickpockets and all the rest of it uh, uh, spiritually sick. And Jesus then said to him, and this is the essence, this is the essence of the Sermon on the Mount, but go and learn what this means. And then he quotes from Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The, you know, when we've gone right through this, right from the very start, it's very interesting that um, the Pharisees were so brilliant at public displays of givings and sacrifices and all the rest of it. They were um, publicly impressive. But Jesus is saying, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the Pharisees were desperately in the need of showing mercy to their fellow Israelites. And Jesus said, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so it sounds like Jesus is saying, I'm associating with this peop these people because they need me and they need salvation. The problem is there's a double entendre here. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I want to bring up two verses that relate to this little passage. The first one is Hosea 6.6. 6. And I asked uh, John to see if we could bring it up in the New American Bible, uh, because in verse 6 it says, For it is loyalty that I desire, this is God speaking through Hosea, not sacrifice and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. That's the whole verse. Jesus only quoted half of it. And that loyalty is also rendered in some translations, obedience. I don't have a problem with that. But what he's saying is, I want loyalty or obedience to the righteousness contained within the uh, Mosaic law, not just empty sacrifice. Anyone can get a goat or a lamb and take it up to the temple, hand it to the priest, they'll cut it, they'll put it on the altar, they'll pour the blood at the base, and then they'll burn the um, various portions of it. And you go away thinking, okay, now I'm right with God. And you are not right with God. A lot of people, when I was growing up as a kid, the first church I attended was a uh, Scottish Presbyterian one. And as a little kid, I was somewhat precocious because I would rather listen in the lounge to our, my parents' discussions with other adults rather than go out and play. And, and I, I used to do that all of the time. And there used to be this scuttlebutt about what was happening, you know, in the community and even within the church, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, gosh, they don't sound very like they're very Christian and all the rest of it. And, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Here we criticise Pharisees for being hypocrites. Well, just pull back and look at the performance of the church over the last 2,000 years. Don't ever blame the Jews as being solely responsible for hypocrisy. It's in all of us. And that's is what Jesus... And then in the second part of that verse, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. 
What knowledge here is not intellectual facts and figures. Knowledge here, when Jesus is speaking, it speaks of relationship. Remember in John 7, 25, when the false um, um, disciples came to him and said, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of this in your name? Um, Prophesy, heal, cast out the, the demons. And he said, depart from me, I never knew you. Knowledge as far as as Jesus is concerned, is relationship. And when you're born again, when you come to Christ, you then have a relationship with another person. Do you understand? It's not something technical. It's not based on the Bible. It's not based on going to church. It's not based on calling yourself a Christian. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in Romans 3.10, he really sticks it at... um, Uh, Paul mentions this uh, in Romans 3.10, but he pulls it out of Isaiah 53, 1-3. And just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So what's he saying to the Pharisees? If you think you're righteous, you are so wrong. And I want to read this. I mean, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't spare, don't spin out, John. But I want to read this. The, the amazing thing, the first statement in, uh, in Psalm 53, I, did I say Isaiah 53? I meant that Psalm 53. He also says this in Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seeks after God. And every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so as I have said from this pulpit time and time and time again, we're all here in this room because of the grace of God, not because of any merit in any of us. And you have to understand that. There is no one righteous. And that's, that's the whole point in Psalm, in Psalm 53. These guys kid, they kid themselves that they are spiritually healthy and just the bee's knees as far as theology is concerned. And in verse 14, we get this. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom, some uh, translations have attendants, don't have a problem with that, but it literally in the Greek, it means the sons of the bridal chamber. Can the sons of the bridal chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And that's a Jewish metaphor for death. And then they will fast. And Jesus is our bridegroom. Oh, when's the wedding, Lord? And we are the bride. But there is also, the church was still an unknown mystery when Jesus was saying this in this context. And there are two verses I pulled out of the Old Testament that shows you that God had a kind of um, husband-wife relationship. And that it's not a husband-wife contractual relationship as far as uh, there are covenants, but it's that um, intimate knowing of each other. And that's why he called Israel uh, out of Egypt to be his witnesses as a nation on the entire earth. And they failed over 1,500 years. And you have to ask yourself how well the church has done over the last 2,000 years. And in Jeremiah 3.20, we have this. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. And in Jeremiah, in the same chapter in verse 8 and 9, Jeremiah actually does... Uh, says, uh, records that God actually does, divorces the northern kingdom, but not Judah. Now, why not Judah? I'll tell you, because there are uh, um, facets of the Davidic covenant that are eternal and, 
and uh, incontrovertible. So God cannot turn that covenant back. So he's always going to be there for Judah. But he did divorce the northern kingdom. And having dealt with the fastings issue, through the bride analogy, Jesus now deals with the reality that what he is teaching and has been teaching since he came into the public to the, uh, to the public in Israel, his teaching is completely opposite to the teaching of Pharisaic Judaism. And Pharisaic Judaism has nothing to do with the Mosaic law. And I'm going to show you something now. Having dealt with that, he's now going to say, my teaching is not, and he gives two examples. But before we get there, I want to actually um, really show you some amazing things that, by the way, if you really want to get into the Gospels, I can no more strongly recommend that you spend some money on this book, all right? It's called Yeshua, the Life of the Messiah from a Messianic Perspective, and it is, contains a harmony of all four Gospels, and everything is explained from a Jewish cultural perspective. And it, it, look, it enriched my relationship with Jesus and, and got me so deep into the scriptures. I, I, I just, it's just amazing. Um, I can't remember what we paid for it. Paul, can you remember what you paid for it? Two, how many? 50? 50 dollars, something like that. You can get that as the abridged uh, version. This one here is part one of a four-part series if you really want to go deep. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get another couple of the, uh, the second and third one. But all of that is based on this. And this is The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. This is by Arnold Fruchtenbaum. And Arnold, uh, the, Alfred Edersheim was a Viennese Jew born in Austria uh, around about the 1850s. And he transferred to, I think, the University of Glasgow it was because he went to Scotland. And he came under the teaching of John Knox, that great Presbyterian. Um, our city where we, Sue and I, were born actually is called Dun Eden. And Dun Eden is Gaelic for Edinburgh of the South. Okay, and the whole centre of the city is a perfect carbon copy of the centre of Edinburgh. And we have an octagon in the centre, and we have this massive, nearly as high as this roof, uh, a statue of Robert the Bruce. And th there's so many Scottish names around there. And uh, so I was amazed that he, he came under the, the, the influence of John Knox. And he eventually ended up in America and he became a bishop in the Episcopalian Church in America. And the, the Episcopalian Church, for those of you who don't know, is the American version of the Anglican Church. So you have to be a pretty committed... And this is back in that, that time in the um, 19th century, start of the 20th century, when, you know, you had to be a, a pretty genuine Christian to get up to be in the bishop area. And so he has written extensively on Jesus' ministry to Israel in that time. And that's where all of the other modern scholars derive a lot of their information from. Uh, in, uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum was an amazing guy. He was uh, born in Russia. His family were Jewish refuseniks in Russia. They were finally let out when he was a younger kid, and they made it to New York, and he came under the influence of a Messianic rabbi and he came to faith in Jesus as a late teenager. And so he got all excited and rushed home and said to his father uh, that he now believed that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, his father severely beat him and kicked him out of the house, and he was never to return. So this, this guy paid for his faith, you know what I mean? And he's an, uh, he's an excellent um, exegete if you want to get really into the, into this, um, the scriptures. But I want to tell you now, and this is what he taught me, but I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to give you two examples after I show you what this. 
Sue has to put up with this, and I had to put up with this. And you might think, this is ridiculous, this could never be. Well, you just wait. The Sofrit, now, what happened? 400 years that, that followed the completion of the Hebrew Scriptures, a transition occurred from biblical Judaism to rabbinic or Pharisaic Judaism. What happened when Ezra came back from the Babylonian exile? He sat down with some of the scribes that came from Babylon with him, and they said, this is a disaster. We must make sure that Israel never, ever, ever gets exiled from this land again, ever. So they tried to work out what they should do. And so they figured, we broke the Mosaic law. And this is how silly human beings try and beat God, all right? So they're going to say, we'll leave the 613 commandments safe there, but what we're going to do is build a gigantic fence around those 613 commandments so that we can never get there to break any of them in order never to be exiled again. Lasted about 500 years. And then they got kicked out again. And so this is happening after uh, um, the, the Babylonian um, exile. And so these guys that sat down with Ezra, and Ezra is one of them, they were sophists, S-O-H, uh, sorry, S-O-P-H-E-R, they were sophias. And they used this form of logic called pilpil. And you're going to laugh, you're going to say, surely no intelligent people would do this. Oh, yes, they do, even to this day. The underlying thought process could be summarized in the following question. Given a specific statement or commandment in the law, in the Mosaic law, how many new regulations could logically be derived from that original statement or commandment? And the following is one example of how pulpalistic logic works, and it drives you nuts. Among the commandments God gave to Moses was one that forbade seething or boiling a kid, a baby goat, in the milk of its mother. Do you remember that? Exodus 23, 19b. It's only half a verse in the entire Mosaic law. And it says, do not seethe a baby goat in its mother's milk. And the reason why is because that's what the Canaanites did, to worship Baal. They would take a kid from the mother, milk the, milk the mother, have enough milk to seethe the baby goat in, its, um, uh, in the mother's milk, cook it, and then present the meat to Baal as a worship service. So all God was saying to the Israelites, don't do that. Well, this is what they did. Jews were not to practice that kind of idolatry, so they were not able to see the kid in the milk of its mother. God gave that commandment to Moses around 1400 BC, and about a 1,000 years later, 400 BC, there were no Canaanites around, and this is when the Sophias were getting together and working out how to save themselves from exile. So no one in 400 BC was boiling kids in the milk of the mother goat anymore. So the original intent of the commandment had long been forgotten. In the school of the Sofrim, the question arose, how do we make sure we never, 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 ever, ever, ever boil a kid in the milk of its mother? It's a redundant question. But that doesn't stop them. That's when the pulpalistic logic begins to work. Suppose you eat a piece of meat, and with the meat you drink a glass of milk. It is possible that the meat is from the young of the animal that also produced the milk. So as you swallow both the meat and the milk, it mixes in your stomach, and you see the kid in the milk of its mother. Can you believe that? They do. They do to this day. I got toned up by one Jew when I did something wrong. I'll tell you what it was. However, the pulpalistic logic went even further. So they set that up, all right? You can't have meat and milk at the same meal. 
However, the logic went further. Suppose at noon you eat a dairy meal and you take a plate and from this you eat some cheese and after you eat the cheese, you wash and scrub the plate thoroughly, but there might be a tiny speck of cheese you still left on the plate that you did not see. In the evening, you choose to eat meat and you place the meat on the same plate from which you ate the cheese earlier in the day. That meat might pick up the tiny speck of cheese. No matter how remote, the meat, um, it just might be possible that the cheese you had at noon was made from the milk of the mother of the baby goat you <laughs> ate later that day. This is what intelligent people are doing. As you swallow this tiny speck of cheese with the meat, you seethe the kid in the milk of its mother and again violate the Torah. So you can't have a milk, meat, uh, milky and meaty uh, meal together, right? So they've worked that out. Now they've worried about this. Thus another new law came into being. All Jews must have two sets of dishes. And they do. Have you been to a Jewish house? They have. One is to be used for dairy products and one is for meat products. I can remember when my son and I were in the building uh, industry, we went to a wealthy Jewish man's home that was being built near the synagogue and, and we were doing glazing and stuff like that and Ben and I had to go into the kitchen and, and look at something in there and I was gobsmacked. I walked into this kitchen and I was standing in the middle and it was like, there was a dividing line right down the middle because that side of the kitchen was a perfect mirror image of that side of the kitchen. There were fridges, um, ovens, benches, cutlery, dishes, and everything on that side, and everything the same on that side. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. So another new law came into being. All Jews must have two sets of dishes. Some of them have gone to the extreme of having a divided kitchen, all right? And you can only cook meat in that side of the kitchen and you can only cook dairy in that side of the kitchen. L listen, legalism grabs hold of you and it doesn't want to let you go. And it's just the same in, in, uh, uh, in, in Christianity. We have so many legalistic um, um, commands put upon us by uh, religious people that have nothing to do with the law of Christ in the New Testament. Uh, when um, Arnold got saved, uh, he was asked to speak at a, a church and when he arrived, he was standing in the foyer waiting for someone to you know, come in and meet him. And he looked, this is you know, 1960s, 1970s um, America, and he was inside the foyer, and he was looking at this huge, um, big um, plaque in the, in the foyer, and it says, you must not smoke cigarettes, you must not drink alcohol, you must not bathe uh, in an area where women are bathing at the same, same time. There's all of these, you must not, you must not, you must not. I mean, I can remember uh, Chuck Smith speaking about that in California. Do you remember that some of this, that you could not go down to Huntington Beach as a group of men if, and swim if there were a group of ladies already in the water. You couldn't do it. I remember Chuck, Missler, uh, Chuck Smith uh, stating that. So what, he, what they're saying now is that if one accidentally uses the wrong dish for the item eaten, the dish must either be destroyed, now listen to this, or given to a Gentile. No Jew may ever eat from that plate again. To each of the 613 commandments God gave to Moses, the Supreme issued multiple new rules and regulations. This process began around about 450 BC. Can I have that screenshot, John, please? Normally, it was passed from rabbi to rabbi, and it is said to have lasted from Ezra the scribe to Rabbi Hillel. Hillel was the conservative rabbi. There was another one called Rabbi Shammai, who was the liberal one around about the same time, 30 years before Jesus. 
and with Hillel came the end of the period of the Supreme. Then a second school of rabbis called the Tanaim, the Tanaim looked upon the work of the Sufrim and decided that there were still too many holes in the fence. They, they continued this process of establishing new rules and regulations from 30 BC until AD 220. And the Apostle Paul was one of these guys. He was a Tanner. And Tanner means trailblazer. So that means that you were a trailblazer in trying to reinterpret the law to keep you safe from breaking it. What are people all around the world at the moment, what's the US Supreme Court doing with the US Constitution? They're reinterpreting it. The words that the original authors wrote mean nothing now, we've got to move with the times. And so they decided that there were too many holes. They continued the process establishing new rules and regulations from 30 to 220, a period from Rabbi Hillel to Rabbi Judah Hanasi. However, the principle of operation changed. And this is where it gets dangerous. The principle of the Supreme was a sofa may disagree with a sofa. They can have an argument, but a tanner but he cannot, sorry, disagree with the Torah. So they had this, this uh, discipline put upon them. They can argue with each other, but they cannot change any of the 613 laws. The principle of the tanners were, a tanner may disagree with a tanner, but he must not disagree with a sofa. And so that meant from 30 BC, shortly before Jesus arrived, all of the thousands of rules and regulations passed down by the supreme became sacrosanct and of equal validity, validity with Scripture. And are you shocked and amazed? Well, who's an ex-Catholic here? You know that in Catholic theology, there are three sources of truth. One is the church, one is the Bible, and one is the human mind. So don't ever think these people are dumb because in Catholic theology, you have three sources of truth. I thought we only had one and that's it there. So the supreme and what they had written now becomes sacrosanct and equal with scripture. And in order to validate the Jewish audience of why the laws of the Supreme were equal to the laws of Moses, the rabbis came up with a teaching that all Orthodox Jews believe and teach to this day. And I have had a blistering argument. I just meant it gently. But I said to one of my Jewish friends, I said, do you realize there's no such thing as the oral law? Bang! Exploded. Whew! What really happened on Mount Sinai was that God gave Moses two laws. The first law was the written law which, came, which contains the 613 commandments that Moses actually penned in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. However, God also gave Moses a second law which is called the oral law because Moses did not write it down. He mem merely memorized it. By memory, they were passed down to Joshua, who then passed them to the judges, who then passed them to the prophets, and who then passed them to the supreme. And you know what? There were some pretty sharp Jews in Israel at the time of Ezra, and they kept saying to the sophists, where did you get this from? That's not in Torah. They were sharp tacks, all right? So the sophists had to run around trying to find out how they can validate making all of these things up. And so the answer was an oral law. And do you see, the thing that really gets me is when you teach and preach out of this, you're held accountable to what's in this. If you have an oral law that is not written down and is simply memorized, how can you be held accountable? That's the problem. That's the problem even with modern Christianity when you see people coming up with weird and wonderful things and they say, um, you know, well, it's sort of in the Bible. Give me a break. And so what we have here is the oral law. And by memory they were passed down 
And so by the third uh, century AD, fewer and fewer people were around to memorise all of these laws. So in AD 220, the rabbis finally wrote them down at the order of Judah Hanasi, the patriarch in the land of Israel. And this ended the period of the Tanaim. After that came a third school of rabbis called the Amorim, plural for Amora, an Aramaic term meaning teacher or interpreter. They looked upon the work of the tanners and declared, no, nah, no, nah, there's still too many holes in the fence. They continued the process of establishing new rules and regulations until about AD 500. But they changed their principle of operation. Their principle was an Amora can disagree with an Amora, but he cannot disagree with a tanner. Thus, all the rules and regulations of the tanners also became sacrosanct, having equal validity with the law. That's how you go way off track. And the work of the Supreme and the tanners together is now called the Mishnah. The work of the Amoraim is called the Gemara, and the two works together, the Mishnah and the Gemara, comprise the Talmud. The Mishnah was written in Hebrew. It averages about 1,500 pages in small print. The Gemara was written in Aramaic and is the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. In the life of the Messiah, the primary concern was not with the Gemara, which was put together after the time of Jesus. It was the Mishnah that became the bone of contention between Yeshua and the Pharisees. The Pharisaic concept was that the Messiah himself would be a Pharisee. I've told you that before. And he would be in submission to the laws of the Mishnah. And you're asking Jesus Christ to accept human logic and intellect to be of equal value to what he gave Moses it was never going to happen. And Fruchtenbaum makes a very important point in here that their plan for Jesus' death had nothing to do with his failure as a Messiah to deliver them from the jackboot of Rome. What they sentenced him to death was because he would not accept Mishnaic rabbinic Judaism. And he spent three, hundred, three, uh, three year and a half years um, in ministry undermining their position in Jewish society. And every time he did it, they got angrier and angrier and angrier. And as I say, um, I look, when I looked at all of this and when I was first studying this years and years ago, I thought to myself, surely, surely they could have woken up. And then when I was doing my church history um, um, section at Bible College, you can see exactly the same things coming through in the church. People adding stuff to the original Gospels or Pauline letters or whatever. There's nothing new under the sun. And so that's, that's the, now that the, you have to understand the antagonism, the antagonism between Jesus and the Pharisees because he was telling the people the truth and he was validating it with his miracles and his teaching. They had nothing. They had outward observance. That's why he challenged them with Hosea 6.6. 6. I would rather have loyalty or obedience rather than sacrifice or a knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You're wasting your time, Pharisees. They did not, they did not like that. And in verse 16... Jesus carries on. He's already said about the bride um, um, issue. But in verse 16, and that's fascinating, about three weeks ago, someone came up to me in the, in the um, cafe and said, can you explain to me the new garment and old garment? I don't understand it. Well, this is your day. So no one puts, Jesus says this, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. And I've just got here a little insert because um, I was laughing when I was reading this. I remember as a child, all right, and I'm going back to the late 50s and early 60s, you young people wouldn't have a clue about this, but old people like Jim and I and Ari and things like that, we were bought clothes that were slightly too big for us 
Can you remember that? And you got jumpers where the sleeves came over your hand and you looked like a dork, you know what I mean? But when mum had finished washing it three times, it fitted perfectly. Yeah. So what happens here is that when you take a new piece of unshrunk cloth and stitch it to an old piece that's already been washed many times and then you wash it, what happens? The new cloth shrinks and pulls away at it. It destroys the fabric. And so Jesus is saying here that his teachings are so incompatible with Pharisaic Judaism that the two cannot be joined together. I hope I've answered that lady's question. Jesus' teaching and Pharisaic Judaism cannot join together. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, wine or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, what they had is they used to skin animals and use the um, pelt as a wineskin, and they used to sew it all up. And so when you put new wine in it, it ferments and it sort of bubbles away and it expands. And so what happens, the, the very new uh, animal pelt will stretch as the wine ferments, all right? But there is only a certain limit to where that um, pelt, pelt will actually uh, um, stretch. So that's it. Once it's stretched and once it's fixed, you can only keep putting old wine into that wineskin. Do you see what I mean? Because Jesus says here, if you put new wine into old wineskins, the wine will break, the, 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 the um, skin will break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. They're tearing apart. They will be pulled apart at the sewing um, um, edges. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and then both are preserved, old into the old and new into the new. new. And do you know what he is saying here? Jesus is saying that he did not come to put his teaching into Pharisaic Judaism. Totally incompatible. Pharisaic Judaism, the, prophet, the, the, the um, outcome of human thinking, and Jesus is teaching divine truth from above. They simply, oil and water, can never mix. And Luke in 5.31 also throws in a verse at the end of this particular part in his um, gospel. And in verse 39, they say, No one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is good enough. And the Pharisees and their followers would reject the new as they and their forebears had fashioned the old. The illustration points out that those already satisfied with what they have got will never seek the new. Never seek the new. And now we, leap, we move from there to another thing. This is where, you know, it's like Matthew throwing all these little gobs of paint at the canvas. And it's from 18 and 19. And while he was speaking these things in the house, when he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler... And other gospels, it's the ruler of the synagogue, came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. So Jesus thought, okay, he's, he's worshipping me. So a Jew would never worship another Jew unless they were saying, you are God. You understand? That's when the, when the leper fell down on his face in front of Jesus and grabbed his ankles. He was worshipping Jesus as God. Jews would never worship anyone else. They might show respect to Pharisees and all the rest of it, but never worship. And this ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, we know that's Jairus, worshipped him, saying, my daughter has just died. In some other translations, uh, sorry, uh, Gospels you've got, she's at the point of death but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And in Mark 5.24, it says this, because there's a lot more that's going on here, because if you don't understand Mark 5.24, then you don't um, uh, understand the woman with the issue of blood. 
And in Mark 5, 24, we have this, and Jesus went with him, this is Jairus, and a great multitude followed him, and they thronged him. That's why I chose this um, translation. They thronged him. Listen, he was being followed by thousands of people, not just a few, thousands of people, because he had thrown these hand grenades into Israel, healing of the leper and forgiving the sins of a paralytic. That had drove, driven everyone crazy. And so they were thronging him wherever Jesus went. And in this particular um, um, situation, he's like this. And he's got three of his disciples with him, and everyone's reaching out, trying to touch him, trying to touch him. They want a bit of his anointing. And so they're thronging him. In the, in the Greek, that word means as weeds choke a garden. The people were so intense around him that he could barely breathe fresh air. And in Matthew 9.20, we'll go back to 9.20, and suddenly, while he's walking to Jairus' house, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Now, I've got a couple of talits at home, and they're the huge uh, robe that um, Orthodox Jews put on. And I wish I could have bought it today, but I think my daughters um, can't find it. But they have tassels all around the edge of that robe. Do you understand? They have tassels off the edge, the hem of that robe. And, and I've worn it a couple of times because I had to. <laughs> um, but the fascinating thing is on all of those tassels around that, I wished I could have shown it to you, they're beautiful garments. On every tassel, there's a number of knots on every tassel. And do you know how many knots there are on a full tallit? 613. So it has the authority of the Mosaic law around the edge of his robe. When Ruth came and lay at the feet of Boaz, because Naomi told him to, and it says Boaz threw over the hem of his cloak over her, and it can be taken the wrong way by people who don't understand this, but what he was doing, the hem of the, the uh, garment is the authority of the wearer. And so what he was doing with Ruth was saying, okay, I'm putting my authority over you. And that's all it was. And so the woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. And how old was um, Tabitha, Jairus' daughter? 12, yeah. And there's been so many elaborate things built around those two numbers. I'll show you what uh, I think it means. It came from behind and touched the hem of his garment, for she had said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her be of good cheer, in another gospel it says, who touched me? And the disciples said, you've got to be kidding, Jesus. There's thousands of people trying to touch you. But Jesus knew that someone had touched him after, who needed healing because it went from him. And he knew that. And he turned right around and he saw this woman. He said this. Note what he said first. Be of good cheer. Where did he say that before? And to whom? The paralytic. Remember that? When they brought him finally into the room where Jesus was in Peter's house and in front of the Pharisees, he said, be of good cheer. That's the only um, phrase that is ever used by Jesus. Be of good cheer. Daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well that hour. And I want to go to Mark 5, 25 and 26 because we sort of build on this a little bit. And Mark 5, 25 and 26, now a certain woman, this woman, had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent how much? All that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. This woman was dying. This woman was dying. Desperate, 
and dying. And in Mark 5.29, after Jesus, after she had touched the, the hem of his garment and he had turned round and said, be of good cheer, your faith has made you well, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Can I have the screenshot, please, John? The ceremonially clean one. That's it. This is where the 12 comes in and, and binds these two people together. Jairus' daughter was 12 and dead. This woman had had this disease for 12 years. She had this flow of blood. So what that rendered her in Jewish society was this. She was ceremonially unclean. She could not go to the temple. She could not go to the synagogue. She could not go out to shop. She could not do anything. She had to get other people, if they would, do that for her. It's like having COVID and people ringing your doorbell and saying there's some food and then running away. It's the same, <laughs> it's the same thing. Second, she was untouchable. Because she had an issue of blood, she couldn't be touched. And she couldn't touch anyone. You understand? She was so socially isolated. She had spent everything she had on doctors. She was destitute and she was now alone. Jairus' daughter, 12 years old, was dead. This woman had the issue for 12 years and was the living dead. You understand? All alone, dying, untouchable, isolated, may as well have been dead. And what did Jesus do? Set her free. Set her free. In Mark 5.35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and who said, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? But see, Jairus had been leading Jesus along to his house through this throng with everyone around them. And they said, why trouble the teacher any further? Your daughter is dead. And no way Jairus was going to let that happen. He had just witnessed the miracle healing of the woman with the flow of blood and heard Jesus say, you have been healed. Your faith has healed you. And Jesus attributed her faith to that healing. So Jairus, with the same faith, because he came to Jesus and worshipped him, which proved that he had faith that Jesus could do this, pressed onto his house with his Lord. And Luke 8.50 has this little part here. But when Jesus heard of it, this is the news that the daughter was dead, he answered Jairus saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. Have faith, Jairus. I have agreed to come with you. I'm not doing it for nothing. You know, when Jesus did something, he did something. In Mark 37, on his way, he only permitted... Uh, Peter, James, and John to accompany him. Why? These three guys were his kitchen cabinet. He was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He trusted these more than anyone else. And when you are going in ministry, you need those people that you can trust. In Matthew 9, 23 to 26, so when Jesus came into the ruler's house, and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They ridiculed him. You see, in that ancient time, death was so common that they knew that this was real. She was dead. And for those of you who are new, I love telling people this, um, I, for two and a half years, worked for a, a funeral company and I loved it. And, we, and I had this big, big Polish, six foot six, 200 kilo uh, ambulance driver from Krakow 
and we were a two-man team that used to drive around in a black Mercedes at night time. And we were called transfer officers. <laughs> you can imagine what we transferred. <laughs> and uh, we had a photograph taken of ourselves in front of the Mercedes and we called ourselves the Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, but let me tell you something. I was a newbie. And I only stayed long enough to do 500 transfers, right? But let me tell you something. You learn very quickly to recognise death because you see it. And these people here, when Jesus said, make room for the girl who's not dead but only sleeping, that's why they ridiculed him because they knew she was dead. But as far as Jesus was concerned, she was only sleeping. And do you know what? Right throughout the New Testament, we have this metaphor of sleep for the death of the Christian because we are all only sleeping. We're waiting for the vertical elevator, all right? And those who sleep in Jesus are raised first. Mm -mm. And so when he said, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping, and they ridiculed him, but when the crowd was put outside because they had no faith, he went and took her by the hand and the girl arose. And he said in another um, version, Tabitha, Tabitha, Tabitha Kumi, I love that. I don't know why it sort of resonates me. And it means, damsel, I order you to rise from the dead. And this report of went out all through the land. And this is the problem now that... All of your um, um, Bibles, if you've got really good commentary Bibles and you look through them, you'll find that there is a harmony of the gospel in them. Have you got any of those? You got a good good commentary Bible? Um, I know all the John MacArthur ones have, and you get to the New Testament and you'll get a harmony of the gospels. It's only a list of four columns on several pages that give all the equivalent verses on, certain situ on every situation where they are uh, mentioned more than once. And it's very interesting that all of the um, reputable commentary Bibles now put these two next um, um, events after Matthew chapter 12. But you see, Matthew doesn't care. He's not doing a chronological um, gospel. He's doing a thematic gospel, and this is all about Jesus' authority over disease and death. So that's why he's got them here. But we will have a look at that when we get to Jan uh, um, Matthew 12, because Matthew 12 is the rejection, national rejection of Jesus. Do you understand? And when that happens, the um, Pharisees come down from Jerusalem, from the uh, Sanhedrin, because they have made their decision on Jesus. Remember, there's a three three stage process: observation, interrogation, and decision. And now they have decided that Jesus and them are never going to get along, so he has to go. And so they come down in Matthew chapter 12, and they tell everyone that his power is derived from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And so everyone thinks, okay. The Sanhedrin have said that. If we profess faith in him, we're in big trouble. Do you understand how wicked they were? And so, but we'll do these two blind men just to get through uh, this chapter. And when you're up there, you know, you'll be able to say to uh, Matthew one day, why did you write such a funny gospel? Why couldn't you do it like Luke, put it in order? And he'd just look and say, hey, Gavor, Gentiles, what do you do with them? And so in verse 27, this is the two blind men. When Jesus, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to add one important point. Prior to the national rejection of Jesus in Matthew 12, Jesus would heal people and do miracles and teach and restore and all the rest of it. And faith wasn't needed because he was there to prove to Israel that he was the Messiah, the promised deliverer. It was validation of his calling. It was the validation of his um, um, all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that prophesied that he would be born of a virgin, 
He would be born in Nazareth. He would be all of these other things, son of David, all the rest of it. When they chose to say, no, you derive your power from Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that was it. Jesus' ministry changed totally, and after that, his whole focus was on training the disciples to be the pillar and foundation of the church. Do you understand? And so what happened after that, not only did Jesus stop te teaching publicly, he only spoke in public in what? Parables. And a parable doesn't explain something. A parable describes something that only a born-again person can understand. And so what happened here is that after, after the national rejection, you had to have genuine faith in Jesus to receive anything from him. That's the total change. Total change. He was still healing. He was still doing miracles in people's lives, but you had to have faith after that. And this is a very important verse to explain this. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, what did they say? That's a messianic title. They're saying, we know that you are the Messiah. A Jew would never say that to anyone that they didn't believe was the Messiah. Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. And they wouldn't have used the word Lord, it would have been Adonai. They would have said, yes, Adonai. They would have called him the Jewish name for the Lord over all the earth. And so then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened and Jesus sternly warned them, saying that no, see that no one knows it. But he had enough trouble. Thousands following him everywhere he went, everywhere he went. And he says, don't go out and blab about this. But when they departed, they spread the news about him all around that country. And here's a part 32 to 34. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, a mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. And I'm not going to expound on that because that's the key issue in Matthew chapter 12. It's the key issue in Matthew chapter 12. Because like the healing of the leper, like saying to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, this is a epochal moment in the ministry of Jesus. Because no one else had ever done that. No one else had ever done that. So when we come back next week, we will do chapter 10 and, and carry on. I can't wait to get to uh, Matthew 12 because that takes us into Matthew 13 and that's the kingdom parables. Oh, I love that. And then that'll eventually get us through to 24 and, 20, uh, 20, yeah, 24 and 25. And I love that. That's all the eschatology you can take. So, Father, we just thank you now that we have come this afternoon to fellowship to worship you, Father, and to learn more about you, Father. And we know, Father, that you are the source of all truth. Your son brought the truth with him to this earth and he spoke the truth in his ministry and it's now recorded in this book, Father. And we praise you, we honour you, we worship you for you have given us your truth in written form so that we can be held accountable, Father. And that you, in fact, will be accountable because you have promised through Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 that there's going to be an event so soon, so soon, that with the blast of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel 
and the clouds of glory that Jesus will come down in the air and the dead will rise in Christ first and then we who are alive and left behind, left after will be translated right up there with them. And Father, seriously, we can't wait. We can't wait to be in your presence, Father. This world has turned the corner. Governments the globe over, Father, are now controlled by hidden hands. And you can trace, Father, all of those hands back to the ultimate conspirator, which is the enemy of men's souls, Satan himself. And so, Father, we just stay here on this earth for as long as you preserve us to be the salt and the light. And, Father, I just thank you with everything that's in my heart that you have given us together the fellowship and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God's people said...